Okay. Uh, thanks for the introduction and thanks for the invitation. Uh, is this open? Okay. So, uh, yeah. As Avi said, I'm a student in Princeton, and today I'm going to talk about uh, 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 orbit intersection and invariant theorem and polynomial identity testing and some bunch of related things. So, but the general purpose of this talk is uh, it's based on a very ambitious goal. It's like, uh, maybe I will say it very, very ambitiously, is how to maybe prove uh, that P is not equal to NP, or some related theorem <laughs> using gradient design. OK, or some related convex optimization type of algorithms. And so today I'm going to focus on the uh, simpler case of this thing, which is called the uh, uh, group or orbit closure. And also a very simple case of group orbit closure. I'm going to demonstrate how can we use uh, some uh, tools from continuous optimization, such as gradient descent, to solve a purely algebraic problem. Uh, so the question that we are interested in is the following. So we have a group G. And then we have a set V. So whenever we have a group and a set, we are interested in like to see what is the action of this group on the set. So we also have an action, uh, G, that acts on the set to set. So for every G inside the group G. Uh, what is the valid action? The action need to satisfy the following properties. So first of all, the unit element uh, will map every V to V. So this E is the unit element in the group G, and V is any element. And also, for every G1 and G2 in G, and every V in V. So if you look at the G1 uh, action on V, and then you act, uh, then you act the, this thing to G2, it should be equal to the First, you do the uh, G1, comma G2 inside the group, and then you act it on V. OK, so this is uh, like the group action. Uh, so given this group action, uh, the, the question we are interested in is like, uh, so for a site, uh, OK. So for element V, uh, we can. For, uh, for some v belongs to v, so we can define the orbit uh, of this v uh, as orbit of v is equal to all the g of v uh, for g inside the group g. So it's just uh, if you look at the group action, what will the action send v to be? So all the possible places. Uh, and also, we can define the orbit of a site is equal to all the g of v for g in a g, and v in a site, site s, for site s, that is a subset of this uh, big space v. OK. So now the question of interest is, like, given site, given site uh, S1 and site S2, whether uh, the orbit of S1 intersect with the orbit of S2. Or this is called the orbit intersection. And also, we are also interested in the uh, orbit closure intersection, which is whether uh, the closure of S1 
intersect with the closure of S2. Uh, if the site V has some structure of that we can define compactness. So these are the two questions of interest. And why these questions are interesting? So they actually covers a lot of the uh, interesting combinatorial problems uh, in computer science. For example, uh, the most uh, straightforward one is just uh, the graph isomorphism. Uh, the graph isomorphism is a very simple uh, instance of this, which is now the group uh, is just uh, the symmetric group on n vertices, and the group action and the v is just a graph set of graph uh, may be undirected uh, graph of n vertices. And then the, for an element uh, G inside S, and for a, for a V that is a graph, and G of V is just a permutation of the vertices, and you generate a new graph. This is a labeled graph. Uh, yeah, just a labeled graph. And then this, uh, the graph isomorphism is just a question of giving uh, one element v1 and one element v2. And we are asking whether the orbit of v1 intersects with the orbit of v2. So this is a graph isomorphism. OK, and there are other uh, interesting problems, such as uh, vp versus uh, vnp, that can also be cast in this framework. But I'm not an expert on that. so. I just copied it from the introduction of our paper, which I didn't wrote. Uh, so uh, anyway, so since this, uh, this problem is interesting, so uh, uh, and it covers a lot of uh, aspects of the uh, uh, algebraic uh, or any combinatorial problems in computer science. So the question is now, how do we solve it? And today, I'm going to describe an optimization approach to solve this uh, seemingly very algebraic problem. And what is the optimization approach? So the optimization approach is uh, generally, we can view like the set of V as the subset uh, or maybe the V itself is just a C to the power of N. And then we can maybe using representation theorem or anything to embed the group into the set of matrices. And then the action is just a, like a multiplication of, uh, of V. So uh, if we have that, uh, if our target set is just a C to the N, which is a complete, complex number in N dimension, and then we can define the following uh, two properties. The first one we can define is the function fv of g, uh, which is uh, the norm of g of v to the square. So uh, this norm is just uh, the Euclidean norm, or just uh, the, the simple norm uh, to the power of 2. You didn't say where well, G is. So G is uh, just uh, in some linear group that acts on, on uh, uh, Yeah, I just said it can be viewed as a multiplication of the vector. So G is a group of matrices. Yeah, G is just, uh, can be viewed as a group of matrices. Of course, you want them to be unitary. You're choosing the two norms so that they're isometric, so you don't care. No, no, no. No, no, no definitely. No, so you, you just, if it's isometry, then it's not interesting. So you <laughs> want it to be, uh, oh, has some course, yeah. interesting structure. So uh, we, can, we can look at this property. And also, we can also look at the following property, which is n of v. That is defined as just the, minimum, uh, the, the infimum of fv of g. 
for any g in g. OK? So this just means that uh, if I take an element v, I will look at what is the what is a group element g that maps v to the to its minimal norm. And so why is this property interesting? Uh, intuitively, if the uh, orbit of g, if the orbit of v1 intersect with the orbit of v2, then this quantity of v1 and v2 should be the same because their orbits are the same. So this covers the same elements. So the infimum should be the same. So, but it's not uh, the reverse is not true. So uh, we need to look at the uh, another property that is called the moment map, uh, which is defined. Uh, it has a intricate definition, but intuitively it is just the uh, it is just the derivative. of the f v of g for g at uh, identity. So intuitively, it is just uh, this property. And what does it mean? It just means that, so first of all, what is the definition of derivative along a group element? And how do you take g to be identity? So the way you're taking this derivative is you look at uh, a map gamma that maps from R to G. So what is this gamma? This gamma is unique, is characterized by element G belongs to G, such that uh, gamma of 1 is equal to G. And gamma, is gamma of uh, any A plus B is equal to gamma A times gamma of B. OK, so gamma itself has is some kind of, you have a geodesic along the group. And then the, uh, at 1, you will get a group elements of interest. And the geodesic preserves the group property. So you look at A uh, plus B is equal to the uh, gamma of A times gamma of B. And if the group has some Lie algebra structure, and this gamma exists, and it is unique. But I'm not, again, I'm not an expert on this. So uh, for simplicity, you can just uh, think of it as some kind of uh, one, uh, one variable characterization of uh, pass in G. So if you have, right? like yeah, it is, uh, the, the yeah, it is <laughs> officially called the exponential map. And uh, once you have this, it's very easy to define the property G, uh, Fv of G. Uh, so it's just uh, the derivative of uh, d of dt of f of gamma t. So uh, for t at 0, this is uh, mu of g uh, of v, f v of this guy. OK? So you can see. Uh, be for the, because of the definition of gamma, so if you put a to be 0, you get gamma of b is equal to gamma of 0 times gamma of b. So gamma of 0 must be identity. So this is like the derivative of the function along the identity. And this is a, uh, like the uh, directional derivative. Um, maybe not. So. Uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, I'm not sure why this, uh, this thing is unique. So if, the, if I pick different element of G, I should get a different definition of this guy. But uh, uh, yeah. You, you didn't say where the image lives. Of uh, Sorry, this is just uh, uh, mu of g is a function from uh, v to r. Yeah. But um, I'm a bit confused by how you define g as a gamma, because you've defined it to be uh, the identity uh, um, at 
Uh, so gamma of one is equal to some element g and yeah. But you said you know, you're right. Well, maybe you saw your look. He said g was the identity element. No, no, no. 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 for the moment map, of course. That's what he was reading there. No, or g equals e. Uh, it's identity when gamma is fixed, so the derivative is zero. Yeah. You can write what gamma is. Gamma, gamma of yeah, yeah. t uh, exponential is a t time. Uh. Yeah. You can write explicitly what yeah. gamma is as a matrix. Gamma as a matrix A is the exponential of A times T. Yeah. So in fact, uh, I think the, if you use this definition, you, uh, you can take any. Uh, yeah, it's more general, yeah. Yeah, you can take any G, and they will give you the same number. So any G other than identity? Mm -hmm. uh, or any G that has. Uh, some unit structure, yeah. I, 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 I'm, I'm not an expert on this, so I, I'm also pretty confused, but for, yeah, so, yeah, but maybe just uh, to take uh, this definition and uh, for, like, maybe just to take this definition for properly chosen G. Uh, it takes an element uh, from V to G to a real number. So you're saying it doesn't depend on the proof element, so uh, what up here? Say it doesn't make sense. Yeah, I mean, at least it doesn't make sense. Maybe. It does not. Yeah, no, I guess. No, if you want to look at the. No, no, uh, they said, of course, it dip, I mean, the moment map is that it's G, which is the. Uh, and it just must be no, a little G, G as no, opposed no, to no, a big G? Okay, mu maybe. Depends on the, yeah, yeah, mu depends on the, of course it depends on oh, the. Oh, I think that's oh, I, you generate. You are, so that's you are maybe. <laughs> <laughs> you are, no, that's a notation of the G. Okay. Okay, so then for identity, it is indeed P. Yeah, for identity, it is zero. And for other elements, it has some other, like, uh, values. So for our group element G, it has, okay. So uh, now this is a crucial theorem uh, for orbit intersection. Uh, so it says that uh, uh, it says that if the if for any for every v one and v two, uh, if uh, the infimum of v1 of that function and is bigger than 0, v1 and v2 are bigger than 0, the infimum of the, of the orbit is bigger than 0, and also, and also uh, if the intersection of v1, the orbit of v1 and the orbit of v2 is not empty, uh, then I think for every g in g, uh, there exists a unique w that is in the intersection of v1 and the intersection of v2, such that uh, mu g of w is equal to 0. Oh, uh, yeah. Sorry. So I, so it, if you look at a close, uh, if you take a close look at of this theorem, uh, so 
let's, let us say that the intersection of this is non-empty, and the, uh, what we know is that the infimum are the, like the same. So mu of v is equal to mu of uh, n of v1 is equal to n of v2. And if you, if you look at the, the element that is the minimal of n of v, then it, the derivative of this thing must be 0 in some sense. So uh, the derivative of this function as the infimum should be 0. But maybe the infimum is not uh, obtainable, but let's just uh, ignore that. So this guy is uh, 0 as the infimum. And this just says that uh, they are, if, they are, if the orbital intersect uh, with each other, then they are uh, 0. Uh, the 0 can be obtained at the same place. So what properties of the Euclidean norm squared are you using? Or for what, which function this is really true, this theorem? Uh, I think the Euclidean norm squared is not really yeah. important. There are, there are a lot of uh, yeah. norms yeah. you can take. It. This is yeah. basically the, the analog of the Lagrange condition for minimizing, uh, minimizing a function. <coughs> but it's a non-commutative domain because of the action of opposites. Basically, but that's so we can bring any moment convex map function. Is, man, moment map is like the Lagrange condition. But that's so we can be any con strictly convex function. Or yeah, 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 it can be. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the, the intersection of these two orbits is itself an orbit, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's enough to prove this just in for one orbit that yeah. there's a unique uh, critical point. Yeah, yeah. You can also say it in that way. So it's strict yeah. convexity. No, no, this is a, it's a comp this is manifold theorem. It's not really a theorem. I mean, it feels there's no silence that's inside of it. It's not, a, it requires geometric invariant theory. It's a serious, serious, serious theorem. It needs a lot of uh, tools that go into this. But uh, I guess all you will use is this consequence. Yeah, and also this uh, uniqueness is not really, uh, there is only one element. It's uniqueness up to the uh, maximum compact subgroup mm -hmm. of this. But uh, again, I don't know. I don't even know what is maximum well, compact set. What you said before, it's a unitary group will not make any change. If it's I a see. Group of, all group of matrices acting, then the unitary group will not make any change. So you can permute W by any unitary action, and everything will stay the same. I so see. So I guess maximally compact uh, subgroup in GLM is the unitary group. Yeah. So uh, I think. Uh, the way of to think of this is like the maximum group that does not change the norm of yeah. this thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's up to the uniqueness, it's up to that thing. Okay? So you just, uh, you're just going to use this theorem, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're well, just going well, to. It, does this theorem have a name or what? Uh, Manfold's theorem. I don't huh? know. Why not Manfold's theorem? Ge geometric invariance theorem. Uh, Manfold's theorem? Manfold, yeah. It's, uh, but it's just part the of the, I mean, it's one of the first. Uh, but is this really true for every convex function, or what's? I the think idea? yeah, that's a good question. I think it's true for every convex. So we could use change to entropy of the vector yeah, or, 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 or something. Yeah, I'm I'm not absolutely sure, but I'm almost sure. strictness for uniqueness, strict, right? Strict, yeah. strict, strict, yeah. Yeah. Strict, yeah. Uh, convex, yeah. yeah. I just have one question, and it's more to innovation. So the moment map is a name for gamma or for mu g of v? Uh, is for a mu, uh, for. For mu g of v is a moment map. Gamma is called the exponential map. Okay. Yeah. Is there a reason it's called the moment map? Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> okay. uh, so, yeah. So this gives us some optimization framework of uh, I, of uh, finding group intersection, uh, orbit intersection, which is uh, we just need to find a common element in. Uh, a common element in like the uh, so we just need to find a, a hmm. sorry so we just need to find an element in W such that uh, the mu of G of W uh, uh, find an element that is in the uh, Oh, so f uh, this gives us our framework. So first of all, we need to find all the element w such that mu g of w is equal to 0. And since this is like uh, a unique one, so if mu g of w is equal to 0 just for one particular w, then we know that this w should be just uh, the 
exact intersection point, and if W is in this but not in this, then it is not a uh, intersect. So, so basically, the optimization framework just uh, is just to first of all to solve this problem, to find that W such that mu g of W is equal to zero, and then it will decide whether W is in the intersection of these two or not. Up to this unique. You're saying the theorem is true for just OV1 and OV2 separately. So if there's a unique W in each one, then they intersect if and only if the W is the same. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I think I should say something about the context of this and also the demand that n of V1 and n of V2 are bigger than zero. They just, there's a certain, yeah, in one sentence, the geometric invariant theory takes this general setup of uh, an action of a linear group on a, on a vector space and it uh, breaks up the, the space into orbits. And you just want to understand what is the space of orbits look like. You want to have a point for every orbit. There'll be a single point that will be a zero point in there. You want to projectivize the space. So there'll be a single point. This is the orbit that belongs to zero, everything that goes to zero, that is uh, you know, in the same orbit with zero. This is called the null cone of the action. And uh, you know, algorithmically finding, testing the null cone of the action was, was done before. And uh, if there are, so you, you can test whether something is is equal to zero. So if one of the v1, v2 is zero, then you could test this. And now the question is to test whether just two orbits are the same or different. It's the most basic question you can ask about this space, whether two orbits are the same or different. And so the algorithmic yeah. question, the input is, is v1, v1 and v2? v2? Yeah. And, and you're assuming in, in the group is, is we can think of g or you want to g? Yeah, you're, you're the same, you're the same, yeah. yeah, so uh, for this work, so we are just considering the very simple case, which is uh, uh, g is equal to the SL uh, n of c times, uh, so for this work, times SL n of c. And then the, uh, the site of v is equal to set of tuples of matrices A1 up to AM. And for each AI, it's in C to the power of n times n. So what is the action of G on V? So uh, action of G can be think of a, a left matrix B and a right matrix uh, C. And G of, so action a uh, group element G can be think of a left matrix B and the right matrix C. And uh, uh, the action of G on this V is just equal to B of AI of C, uh, these tuples. OK, so just the left multiply the matrix by B, and then your right multiply the matrix by C. And this is a group action of the uh, this is a group action on this side. Okay, so for this work, we want to decide, uh, given uh, uh, two element, two element v one and v two of the tuples, whether their uh, group action, uh, whether their orbit in this group action intersect or not. Okay. So, so the so the index on the v is the a's go from one to the m there. Uh, yeah, this is m. m. Yeah. And one of the SMNC multiplication is on the left and the other is on the right or something. So, so th this would be an action. Otherwise, you want to put the C in there yeah, or something. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, that's yeah. Right. <laughs> or maybe you'll put the C transpose yeah. here. Good, yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, so the question now is just uh, uh, you are given <coughs> the tuples A, A1, and AM, and also another tuple prime, A1 prime, AM prime. Uh, 
uh, and then you want to say whether uh, the orbit of A1 intersect with the orbit of A2. Uh, sorry, A prime. The closure. Uh, yeah, the closure intersect with the closure of A prime, uh, which just means that whether there exists uh, a matrix, a left matrix B and the right matrix C such that uh, this guy is uh, uh, close to this guy like arbitrarily. And what is uh, now we can following the following follow the uh, optimization approach that we just uh, described. And so first of all, we are going to look at what is the function of uh, this thing. So uh, or maybe first look at what is fv of g. So fv of g for g is equal to b and c, and this v is equal to a tuple of a. This is e just equal to the uh, Euclidean, uh, just equal to the Fubini swarm of the b times ai times c transpose summation i equal to 1 up to m square. So you should think of this like it lives in the tensor space of uh, matrix, ten tensor matrix, tensor matrix, tensor matrix. And then the two norm of this thing is just uh, the two summation of the two norm of uh, each thing. And the two norm, and the Euclidean norm of a matrix is just a Fubini norm of a matrix. OK. so just uh, this uh, value. And uh, what is n of v? This is just equal to the minimum of, or, or the infimum of, of b and c, summation of i equal to 1 up to m, this guy. OK. And then we can look at what is the, uh, uh, so uh, it turns out n of e is uh, very closely related to another uh, property that we already know, which is called the capacity of, the, of uh, a1 up to am. So what is the capacity function? Uh, for uh, before defining capacity, we first define uh, action T of a of a matrix X, which is just equal to summation of a i times X a i uh, conjugate transpose. And then the capacity of this is the standard definition in quantum information theory. It's just uh, called the completely positive matrix. Oh uh, yeah. And the capacity of this operation T of A is equal to uh, by uh, infimum over X that is positive uh, definite, the determinant of T of A of X over the determinant of X. A little bit completely positive. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, then uh, we know that n of a is actually equal to uh, n times the capacity of t of a to the power of 1 over n. OK, so we have this thing, which means that minimizing the, uh, minimizing the n of v is just uh, equal to minimizing the capacity of uh, the capacity of this operation. Okay. Definition is due to do this, and uh, 
Yeah. Right, simple. Right, right. So, so can, I'm, I'm just confused. How does it relate to uh, what we wanted before? Uh, we, because we want to minimize uh, n of v, which is uh, basically finding the finding the point w that such a new g of w is equal to zero is like minimizing n of v. Okay. Yeah, because minimizing of function is like uh, finding a point that the derivative is zero. Mm -hmm. So you want to minimize this thing. You want to minimize this property, s and which means that you want to minimize the capacity. Yeah. And so basically now uh, our, our op optimization approach is just uh, the following two steps. So first of all, uh, we want to minimize the capacity of T of A. And then we want to minimize I'm sorry, I have a question. Yes. Uh, so in this formula here, does A mean two A with the vector error mean two different things? Because on one side the A's are the same, AI, AI transpose, but I thought that they were uh, different left and right in the formula. No, 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 no. no they are the same. A, yeah, A is a vector with a tuple of matrices, and the way an operator oh, is defined okay. is with this. I understand. Uh, yeah. the A has you, you, you maybe yeah. were confused by yeah, the action. Is, the action yeah. is a separate multiplication. <laughs> but it's not the same. Yeah, it's this just is another way of, uh, of uh, looking at the tuple of matrices. Yeah, this is just a definition of uh, capacity uh, of the A. Uh, a completely positive action, and this is the definition of capacity. Is it as simple to compute if you look at just one SLN, so you have multiply B times B A I B transpose instead of B A I C? No. And then, then it's very hard to guess the computer. No, minimum. no, in both cases, uh, okay. So if you want a little bit of history, the same question with one SLN, that's what you're asking, yeah. simultaneous conjugation, mm -hmm. uh, testing equivalent was known because it's relatively recent. It's a combined result of uh, Malmali and then uh, Fox and Pilka. And it uses the, it, it uses the you know, invariant theory that uh, is understood for this group. What are the invariant polynomials of this, this action? Uh, the story here, it's more general because uh, you can embed the simultaneous action in the question of the action of two SLN. Simply add an identity matrix that really forces the same side to be versus one another. Anyway, uh, so this is a more general question. And the solution here is very different than the solution there. There is an algebraic problem which has an algebraic solution. It's completely algebraic. Well, it's an, an actually works over every field. Uh, this is an uh, analytic or uh, you know, optimization solution that works over cartridge. Instead, I just want to bring in if I do this minimum of the n of v in the in for the one major for one SLN case, it's it's still a determinant like this. Or I don't I don't know of any any uh, you know ex except for embedding the problem in this problem and then running the whole thing. I don't have simpler way. I see. Okay, so I so the the general optimization approach is you first you want to minimize the capacity of t of a. And then you want to minimize the capacity of T of uh, A prime. OK. So or maybe instead of minimizing, because this is just a number, we want to find the arc mean. But actually, this uh, capacity, the arc mean may not be achievable. So uh, but let's, let's first uh, forget about this achievability issue. Let's say we can find the exact arc mean. In, uh, finite, uh, the arc mean is finite, so we find the x of a, which is equal to the arc mean of the capacity, and then we find the arc mean x a prime, which is equal to the arc mean of the capacity of the other thing. And now, 
uh, after finding the arc mean, what does it mean? So uh, what, what does it mean by the arc mean of x is equal to uh, x, x of a is equal to the arc mean? So if we look at this thing, uh, which uh, let us define. So our uh, a tilde of i is equal to a i times x to the power of a half, x a to the power of a half. Then what does this mean? This just means that uh, the arc mean of the capacity of T of this A tilde is equal to identity. So because the x, x, uh, x A height is already the arc mean of this, so changing x, height, a, x, a, uh, x A will not uh, increase, uh, will not decrease the capacity any further which means that the arc mean of this guy must be as the identity. <coughs> OK. And what does it mean by the So now what does it mean by the capacity of something is equal to identity? Uh, it is a known theorem. I don't know what is the correct reference, maybe Gorris. Uh, that uh, the capacity of this thing is equal to identity if and only if the uh, A is called. Uh, yeah, uh, so, sorry, the argument. Of this guy is identity if and only if the matrix is uh, doubly stochastic. Not the matrix. Uh, the uh, operator is doubly stochastic. Is, uh, by yeah, it's by Gorris. Maybe you. Uh, summation AI tilde AI tilde transpose is equal to summation of AI is equal to some alpha times identity for some value alpha. Wait, so you defined AI tilde to have this property already, but now you're saying this is true for like any no, no, the no. capacity, if the argument of capacity <coughs> is the identity, yeah. then the operator is doubly stochastic in this time. Yeah, but here, does this apply it, just the, the to the tilde? Yeah. Or no, yeah, 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 you don't need this. Oh, you, you don't need this A tilde. So for any, so for any A, is, if the capacity is equal to identity, maybe or we put two tilde to make sure that it is not that tilde. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so for any, for any tuple, if the capacity is identity, if the argument of the capacity is identity, <laughs> this means that the uh, operator is uh, doubly stochastic. OK? Uh, so uh, and also and also this means that uh, so uh, so now we can so now the uh, the general goal is just uh, we look at uh, this tuple a tuta which is uh, defined here. And the next step, we look at the A tilde, which is defined there. And we also look at the A tilde prime, which is uh, AI prime times x uh, prime to the power of a half. <coughs> and then uh, uh, the, this is the arc mean of the capacity of T of A. And this is the arc mean of the capacity of T of A high. And that by the theorem uh, that is here, I'm, and I already erased. And there should be, and these two things should be unique up to the maximum compact action of the group. So which means that A tilde must be equal to A prime. 
up to the maximum compact action. Do I even need to Ah, yeah, I haven't. So what is the maximum compact action of this thing? It's very easy to see what is the action that preserves the Fubini swarm of any matrix. It's a unitary matrix. So which means that the B and C must be unitary, and then it will preserve the Fubini swarm of uh, any matrix. So which means that A tilde must be equal to A tilde prime up to unitary. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Two or unitary actions, yeah. which means that there exists a U and V, which is in the unitary of C, <laughs> such that uh, U times A I V is equal to A I theta prime for every I. Okay. So now this is uh, very good. So we are already getting to the optimization part. But so far it's a reduction. It uh, was the, uh, you know, the problem was to make, to check if they are equivalent under the SLN action, and if you can do matrix minimization, then it reduces to equivalent under the unitary action, which is a simpler problem. Yeah. So the, now the two steps are, first of all, you want to solve the arc mean of the capacity function, capacity function. And the second step is you want to check unitary e equivalence OK? So uh, originally, the problem is just to check the equivalence for all the group actions. So the whether the two orbits intersect along all the group actions. But now after uh, minimizing this, we are just reducing it to unitary equivalence. And for unitary, for exact unitary equivalence, uh, it was known by a, uh, that you can check about it by a variant of Forbes and uh, Splica. Uh, by a variant of this paper, you can actually check the exact e unitary equivalence. And so now if you can minimize the capacity uh, up to exact thing, and then you can just use their algorithm to check unitary equivalence. But now the, here is a problem. So the capacity is defined as the infimum of something. And this, this is a, uh, a positive a definite constraint, and the infinite infimum may not be obtainable, which means that we may not find the exact minimizer of the capacity function, T of A. So now here, we don't have the exact, we may not have the exact minimizer. And actually, you cannot hope to have the exact minimizer because there are simple examples where uh, these A's are all like integer matrices, but the minimizer is irrational. So you don't have exact minimizer at all. It's infinite bit complexity. So it can only work with uh, non-exact minimizer. So it can only work with inexact minimizer. Now we have E exact minimizer, then we cannot apply the exact unitary equivalence. So we also need the E exact unitary equivalence. OK. So you have some small error that you have to yeah. allow for. Yeah. So now the question is how small this arrow need to be in order to make sure that everything works out. So you have here in exact minimizer means you have some small arrow epsilon, and in exact unitary you also have some small arrow epsilon. And now the question is what is uh, how small epsilon needs to be in order to 
make sure that this framework also works out. And if epsilon is zero, then everything is fine. But we cannot hope for uh, zero epsilon. So uh, what's the question is interesting when n equals two, just two matrices. Yeah, that's what I want to make. I want to know an example of this, because uh, otherwise I don't know where So can we think of two matrices, or is this all yeah. worth Yeah, it is already interesting if you have okay. two matrices. Okay. If it's yeah. one matrix, then it's trivial. You yeah. just, yeah. So, yeah. so, so, why, so why are the, what, is there a specific example you have in mind with two matrices or some finite number? No. I mean, I'm no. just trying to understand the motivation for this in, in computer science. I'm not the sure motivation sure. is uh, what he wrote here is still there, three different and then clean quotes. <laughs> What's that? On the top of the first board. Yes. Three equals and clean quotes. Well, how, how the motivation. <coughs> <coughs> the motivation is this uh, PIT problem of uh, polynomial identity testing. And yeah. the, the uh, question I have is uh, Maybe I can say it. So yeah. the question of interest is, so you want to uh, decide whether two polynomials are equal or not. And usually these two polynomials are succinct uh, encoded in a circuit. So you have this uh, circuit that has some multiplication and plus case. And then this is x1, x2. And you want to say whether these two circuits encode the same polynomial. And we are looking at a simpler problem, which is whether the two determinants encode the same polynomial. And so what is a determinant polynomial? Uh, f of x1 up to xn of a tuple A is equal to the determinant of summation of AI XI. OK, so XI are variables, and these AIs are the matrices. So you have some linear combination. Yeah. Okay. And then, the, and then the, there is a theorem saying that if the two determinant polynomial are exactly equal, it means that uh, the orbit of AI intersect with the orbit of A2. Well, and all up to, and then you need to multiply a constant. No, it's not quite. I mean, that's the only issue. You have matrix. The, the XIs are. Oh, uh, yeah. Are, are, uh, yeah, matrix. these XIs are matrices. Yeah, matrix. uh, matrices variables. So a variable that contain matrices. So, so these, are th then these are non commutative polynomials. Yeah, these are non commutative polynomials. Okay. Anyway, the, the, the motivation, this kind of problem, this kind of problem is easy when the number of n or m are constant, 2 by 2 and so on. You just expand these determinants and you see. But when the number of variables is n, something, then the obvious way of testing such equivalence or testing whether the determinant is zero is exponential time. So what this leads to, in particular, is a polynomial time algorithm to, to solve this problem. Yeah, so now the question is how, cl how small epsilon needs to be in order for the framework to work out. And so there are few regimes of epsilon that. You can switch both if you want, you know, if, but I don't know what you should have. I, yeah, so there are, there, are, there are different regimes of epsilon. So now our problem is of size n. And then epsilon can be maybe just an inverse polynomial of n, which is very good. And epsilon can also be inverse exponential of n, which is not so good. And maybe epsilon is even smaller, uh, exponential of exponential of n or something like that. And then definitely we cannot deal with this case. We cannot minimize a function of uh, with double exponential accuracy in polynomial time. If we can do that, this means that the optimizer is uh, rational. So for this problem, actually epsilon lies in this regime. It's uh, inverse polynomial is, uh, inverse exponentially small. So which means that if we can minimize, if we can find the arc mean of the, uh, if we can minimize the capacity of an uh, operator up to exponentially small in terms of the problem size, and then if we can solve the unitary equivalence when there is an exponentially small error, then we can uh, 
get back to the original problem. So we can deal with uh, exponentially small error in the processes here. Yeah. Known. And this does not solve this always intersection problem. To have uh, enough, uh, you know, to, in order to solve always intersection, you need to approximate it to an exponentially small error in polynomial time. And this is the content of this. Uh, yeah, so. In all of these things, if you just you throw in the closure, everything becomes easy. If you just want to know if the, the, thing the, the same order. No, no, this is only about the closure. This question. Is about the closure. No, but if you just want, uh, it's still true you want to decide if the two orbits are equal. Ah, that's a, yeah. Is that an easier question? No, no, not necessarily. Oh. It's a, just a different question. A different, okay. And and in the case in the in uh, compact groups or I mean uh, on uh, continuous groups, it's more interesting and more natural to study the closure. I agree. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, that's uh, yeah. Uh, but it, there are two different. Uh, the simultaneous conjugation problem. So I just give you two tuples of matrices and ask whether you can conjugate one to get the other. Uh, both are interesting. Uh, if you don't talk about closure, then it's called the modular isomorphism problem. Mm -hmm. And it has a group theoretic solution, which is a big one. And looks very different than all of this. Okay. And if you look at closure, it's the opposite. Yeah. Yeah. They, are, they are both interesting. They don't reduce to one another. Yeah, so for this problem, we are actually having a uh, exponentially small epsilon. Uh, so now the question is, so how do we find, how to find uh, x of a, maybe prime, or maybe tilde, such that uh, x a of tilde uh, this capacity uh, T of this thing, determinant of this over the determinant of this is uh, smaller or equal to maybe 1 plus epsilon times the uh, minimum of the capacity of the capacity of T of A. Okay, for in time poly e of n, and then we definitely need the log of 1 over epsilon, because epsilon is an exponentially small thing. So if we want a polynomial time in n, then we need a log 1 over epsilon here. So now you reduce the problem, I guess, now. This is where you, where you get started, right? This is where you reduce the problem to, to yeah. an algorithm for fast finding an approximate minimum. Yeah. yeah. So you need an algorithm that run, converge linearly in terms of epsilon, <coughs> which just means that it has a log 1 over epsilon convergence rate you know, to get a minimizer of the uh, capacity. And this problem is, is, is non-convex? Uh, this problem in this way is not convex. Uh, but but it's, it's geodesically convex. Like yeah, it's that, geodesically that's convex, point. yeah. <laughs> and also, there is another thing, which, which is uh, if we know that uh, whether we can decide we can decide uh, ui times a, uh, whether there exists a u and v such as ui times a, uh, u times ai times v minus ai prime. The Fubini swarm is smaller or equal to epsilon, or bigger or equal to some e smaller exponential of n times epsilon in time. Log 1 over epsilon. Okay, so these are the two optimization problems of interest. 
The first is how to minimize the capacity up to epsilon in time poly n log one or epsilon. The second one is how to decide whether the two matrix are y unitary equivalent, or I should say this is in a, uh, u of n of c. Uh, whether the two given tuple of matrices are unitary equivalent, uh, whether they are unitary equivalent up to epsilon, or there is nothing that makes them unitary equivalent. So every unitary matrix will be have a, a exponentially larger gap in time poly n times log one or epsilon. OK? And these are both geometrically uh, convex? Uh, no, this problem is not convex at all. We need to use a separate algorithm. And so let's, uh, due to a time limit, maybe we first uh, quickly describe what is the uh, first argument, uh, the first ar algorithm. So how do we f minimize a function in uh, log one or epsilon time? So there are, maybe let's start with convex function. So there is an algorithm that is called the ellipsoid. algorithm that can do it. And also there is another algorithm called the interior point. Uh, which has uh, both of the algorithm has log one or epsilon convergence rate. OK. And also there is another special case where the function is strongly convex. And then the gradient design also has log one or epsilon convergence rate. OK, so ellipsoid is a bit special. It's like a geometry algorithm. But these two algorithms are pretty similar. Their spirit is to say how good is a, how close is a function to quadratic. Oh, sorry. So how close is a function to quadratic? And what is a strongly convex function? A strongly convex function, or I should say smooth and strongly convex. So what is a smooth and strongly convex function? A smooth and strongly convex function is just uh, the following, satisfies the following simple property. It's for every x. So there exists uh, alpha and beta bigger than 0, such that for every x, the Hessian at a point x is smaller of the alpha times identity and bigger than beta times identity. So the Hessian is lower bounded by beta and upper bounded by alpha, which means that the uh, uh, Hessian is very close to a Hessian of a quadratic function, which is maybe a square root of alpha over beta times identity. It's the Hessian of the function. Yeah, it's the Hessian of the function. Hessian. Oh, that's sorry. I should say it's the Hessian of the function. Uh -huh. All right, a point x. Yeah, <laughs> sorry, sorry. So it's bigger. So a strongly convex function just has this property. And what is the interior point method? Interior point method, the way I view it is instead of looking at the identity here, you have another matrix that you will say that the beta mx uh, I, or mx0 is of fx smaller or equal to alpha times x x0 uh, for every x that is sufficiently close to x0 something. So basically, it just means that the Hessian is locally constant. Uh, lower bounded by some constant matrix and upper bounded by the same constant matrix. 
uh, for anything that is uh, close enough to x0. And if you have this property, you can first multiply m uh, x0 inverse to your gradient. And then it's the same as minimizing a strongly convex function inside this region. And if this region is large enough, you will also achieve a linear convergence rate. And that is the uh, idea of interior point method. How does the convergence rate depend on alpha over beta? Uh, the convergence rate for gradient design, it will depend on uh, alpha over beta. Like yeah. Linearly? Yeah, linearly. Yeah, but you can do faster using accelerated gradient design, which has a square root here. Uh, for interior point, is uh, the alpha and beta are actually constant. Yeah. So now the question is, how large is this region, and how do you find such a region? And the interior point method rely on the following thing, of the the so-called self-concordance. Uh, self-concordant property, which just says that the, uh, the third derivative of x plus vt uh, for every v of norm 1 and for every t, uh, the third derivative of this with respect to t, yeah, with respect to t, uh, this thing to the power of uh, uh, is smaller or equal to the uh, second derivative of x plus vt t to the power of 3 over 2. Okay? This is a definition of uh, self concordant function. It must satisfy for every v and for every t. If I look at the directional derivative along the uh, along v, and also this is for every x, uh, so centered at x and along the direction of v, uh, then it is smaller than the <laughs> second derivative. So this just means that when the second derivative is very small, then the change of the s second derivative is, is also very small, and that is exactly what we need. For example, here if the second derivative is pretty small, and then this side is not very safe, but uh, the changing is also very small. So we can make sure that uh, the ratio of the second derivative uh, is a constant within a large region. OK? So if you work out the formula, you can see that the, uh, the second derivative will be a constant, will be a constant uh, in a, within a constant ratio in a region that is like an ellipsoid. So, yeah. And this is uh, the how the interior point method goes. And for our problem... You can lift the bottom ball that... Uh, yes. So for our problem, uh, first, the function is not convex. And the second of all, the function is not uh, self-concordant. So what should we do? And we will show that instead of convex, we will have geodesic convex. And instead of self concordant, we will have self robust. Okay, and these two properties also give us a linear convergence rate. And what does a geodesic convex mean? So a function, so a function f is geodesic convex. Uh, if, first of all, you have a geodesic, which is parameterized by gamma, so gamma t is the geodesic path, and such a gamma prime at 0 is equal to some velocity v, 
then a uh, function f is geodesically convex if and only if f of gamma t is convex. So you'll have this geodesic. You have this geodesic path, and you have the function f that uh, is gamma of t, which is uh, a univariable function mapping from r to r. And this function is convex just in this one dimension. And this has to be true for every geodesic path gamma. The geodesic, uh, I suppose, has to have units t, right? Uh, no, it doesn't matter doesn't because, matter. yeah, if you, you can think of, uh, if, if this function is convex, then you multiply by any constant here, it's also convex. Yeah, so it doesn't matter. So for our problem, what is a geodesic? Uh, it's just a so first. The space is first of all. I mean, the space is a positive definite matrix. Yeah. So for our problem, we are we are looking at minimizing uh, the determinant of summation of AI x ai conjugate transpose over the determinant of x. And it's the same if I put a log here. So minimizing over x. Yeah, minimizing yeah. over x that is positive semi-definite. <laughs> and what is a geodesic on the positive semi-definite <laughs> form? Uh, it is characterized by the following thing. Uh, so gamma of t is equal to the exponential of uh, t of v, uh, t of a matrix, uh, t of v. So gamma derivative at 0 is just equal to this matrix v. OK, so this is a geodesic path that we are intre that of interest. And it is known that this function is uh, convex, geodesically convex under this uh, geodesic. OK? So now the question is how to uh, minimize a geodesically convex function. So this, is, this is what? A ge this is a geodesic in the space of positive matrices? Yeah, so it's exponential to some matrix. So it's a uh, bigger C. It's a uh, PIC. For, for V, it's uh, yeah. Symmetry. Uh, why is that positive def? Yeah, that's my question too. Why? What the, why is it positive? Why? Why? It's an exponential of some matrix. So. No, no. Uh, you have a matrix which is positive. Square roots are okay, but you can't take. You can't. A square of a matrix is not necessarily positive. Uh, which way does it go? Wait, what does it mean? You can view V as uh, some U times D times U transpose, and then your exponential of T of V is equal to U times the exponential of T of D times. And this is uh, bigger than 0. Yeah. 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 And in this space, there is the notion of a geodesic. Right. What you were saying is A is smaller yeah. total B. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. doesn't imply the yeah, exponential yeah, yeah. of it. Well, these are irrelevant. But uh, you should try. I mean, many of these will come up tomorrow. So I don't know. You should probably plan <coughs> on how you close today and uh, uh, maybe say what you will yeah. yeah, so tomorrow I will uh, give up. Tomorrow I will show, give a proof like uh, how the, why this is uh, geodesically convex, and also I will describe the algorithm that uh, checks the uh, inexact unitary equivalence, which turns out to be pretty tricky because of the 
in exact uh, thing. Yeah, so uh, just uh, talk maybe, uh, let me define what is. Uh, some sort of theorem that you're aiming for to say that then any, I guess, non positively curved, simply connected manifold, if you have a function which is geodesic convex, you can define self robust. Yeah, well, I haven't defined and self robust. You minimize a, a function like that and any such. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. And any simply connected uh, non positively curved manifold. So it's trivial, let's say, on the hyperbolic space. Or what about on a product of trees? Or I don't, I don't know. There is a the, yeah. There is a general theorem which uses this. Uh, yeah. uh, but you need some bounds that match something. Yeah. So for self-robustness, uh, it's the following very simple property. Remember, self-concordant is just uh, the third order is bounded by the second order to the power of three over two. And for self-robustness on a geodesic uh, convex function, it just means that the third derivative of gamma of t is actually bounded by uh, the second derivative without uh, the power. OK? So this is a convex, so this is bigger than 0, uh, bigger or equal to 0. So the self-robustness is just a version of self-concordance, but we, you don't have this power 3 over 2 there. You just have a uh, plant uh, smaller or equal. And this is only true uh, when gamma prime of 0, the norm is equal to 1 for all gamma. So for all unit speed geodesic, the uh, second order, uh, the third order derivative is bounded by the second order derivative without any constant. And just uh, to look at the dif difference between these two definitions, these two definitions uh, actually, the norm of V is not very important because if you multiply a constant alpha here, you will get alpha cube here. And here, you will get alpha square. And then it will still give you an alpha cube. So this thing is actually not needed in interior point. It's some of a homogeneous definition. But uh, our definition is not. If you put in an alpha here, you will get alpha, square, uh, alpha cube here. but here you only have r square, and there is no power. So you definitely need the unit speed <coughs> geodesic. And then we know that our function has this property. And if you have this property, you can see that the function is also like a quadratic function in certain re region. Actually, the region that will be an infinity norm bound, or a spectral norm bound for matrices. And then we will show that with this thing, you can also minimize the function in uh, log 1 or epsilon convergence rate. And I will prove this tomorrow. Yeah. And yeah, just uh, for unitary equivalence uh, thing, w yeah, w what we will use is, uh, is a version of Wedding theorem. It's called Wedding Theorem. Uh, so it just says that if the two matrix are unit, uh, uh, if, the, if u times, so if u times a times v is very close to a uh, prime, so, and also if a has a singular value gap, then the singular vectors of u are close to the singular vectors of v. And so we can keep decomposing this. Uh, a and A prime up to singular values. And then uh, we can shrink the problem into a smaller set until the singular values of A and A prime are all the same. Then they are themselves are unitary matrices. And then the problem becomes easier. Yeah, so these are the general plan, and I will talk about it tomorrow. OK, thanks.